Well, again, thank you for the warm reception. You are my kind of people. I can't wait to talk to accountants. As a matter of fact, next week I'm going to Philadelphia to speak to the Pennsylvania Society of CPAs. I leave on a plane this afternoon at 5 o'clock to go to Pinehurst. I'm on a panel with Congressman Amo Houghton there to talk about the budget process. In about a month, it's Ohio. It gives me a, a great deal of satisfaction to talk our language to people who I know understand what's going on. You may not be able to change it, but you have a better understanding than most of what's going on. I'm going to concentrate right now on what I call the credit card mentality that we have today in government at every level. The fact that we don't mind spending now as long as we can defer the payment. In many cases, we don't even want the bill now. We issue government guarantees so we get billed later. And what have we created? We've created an environment for that. Because government today, and I spent 22 years in the profession, and four years in Congress, I've looked under the numbers. I think I know what I'm looking at. We're not using the best systems, the best accounting principles, the best procedures. In many cases, we're using the worst. And that's what bothers me. Um, I keep clippings from the press. We talk about the debt. Let me just read you. Here's something from the Wall Street Journal not too long ago. Um, the title is wonderful. If a recession hits, is the U.S. prepared for it? And the first sentence is, the United States may be about as well prepared for the next recession as Exxon was for the Valdez oil spill. Boy, that doesn't give you too much comfort, does it? Then, another telling paragraph. Because of changes in both the economy and government policy in the past decade, the next recession could be particularly painful. The borrowing binge by American corporations may make them especially vulnerable. The, weak, the weakened social safety net may fail to catch some human victims. The intractable federal deficit may rule out a quick government rescue of the economy. And this is the preeminent financial journal. These are the economists speaking. Here's a, another article. After they got the deal on the budget that they got, I guess it was um, in the middle of April, the article starts off. This is Gannett, Westchester County. The fiscal 1990 budget pact between President Bush and Congress produced in weeks of high-level bargaining and praised as a lofty success by its authors is already coming under fire. And it goes on to describe how they used every gimmick in the book to come up with $28 billion in reductions to get under the Graham-Rudman limit, which is just under $100 billion. But what they didn't tell you, but what's pointed out, is that last year's deficit for the fiscal, no, the fiscal year ending this year, 1989, you know what's happening. The actual deficit is $163 billion. How do you reconcile $28 billion from 163 and get to 99 point something? They're playing another shell game. What they're saying is, all we have to do is project that we're going to meet Graham Rudman. We don't have to go back to the actual spending of last year. Where are we heading? What's going to happen in 1991? It's, it's to me obvious that we're not prepared. And here's a quote from Carol Cox, president of the Bipartisan Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Quote, if American corporations prepared their financial statements based on the way this proposal was put together, their officers would go to jail. There's no doubt about it. SEC rules would never permit you to sell assets, put the entire proceeds into the P&L, and yet our elected officials are doing it with your money and they're hardly being accountable. Here's another article. Gimmicks help avert a budget confrontation but leave the hardest question unanswered. An article, a little excerpt. The dimensions of the 1991 challenge aren't a matter of partisan dispute. Senator Pete Domenici, well respected of New Mexico, senior Republican on the Senate Budget Committee, said he figures that $60 billion of added revenues and spending cuts are needed to bring fiscal 1991 deficit down to the $64 billion target in the Graham Rudman law. And hardly. It's, going to, it's not going to be done without more smoke and mirrors. Uh, but then when you go on and you read this, you begin to realize that not even 
respectable people like Pete Domenici have the, the confidence that this is going to work. And finally, this is the one that pained me the most, because I thought we had something going last year when they announced the National Economic Commission. You remember that, the NEC? Well, they came out with their report, and painfully, the U.S. deficit panel split along party lines, prepares a final report, uh, and frankly, it's just another litany of gimmicks. It's a litany that says that the political process is for some reason, and for many reasons, not prepare, prepared to deal with finding the real solution to this whole shell game that we've created. Let me show you what I think the real problem is. Now, many of you saw me in Washington, and I had this as a congressman. Uh, they let me keep it. I can't use it anymore. And many of you probably don't know what this is. And I'm usually surprised that not more people know what this is. This is the card that you give your representative when you elect him or her. This is a congressman or congresswoman's voting card. We have in the House of Representatives uh, terminals at the end of a row of seats. It's democracy in action. 435 names go up in lights. You put this into the terminal. When the button says open, you press yes, a green light goes up by your name. You press no, a red light goes up by your name. You press present for a quorum call, it's orange. And if you change your vote in that 15 minute period, your constituents, whoever's, in, who's ever in the gallery, would be able to see that if anyone's pressuring you. Democracy in action. Well, I took this out one day. It was right next to my American Express card. And I said, you know, it looks like a credit card. And then it dawned on me, my God, it is a credit card. Because every time we put this in to vote, whether it's a, an authorization or certainly an appropriation, when you have to cut the check, because, you know, this is the card that forces the Treasury to write the checks. This is the card that forces the Treasury to sell the bonds to get the cash to write the checks. And since when we vote on these programs and appropriations, there's not enough money to cover them, this is a credit card. Simple as that. Now, I said to myself, I've got to take this message to the American public. Because the public doesn't really understand balance sheets, profit and loss statements. But you know what everybody understands? Credit cards. Each one of us has some kind of a credit card and a credit card statement. And I says, maybe I can make the point using this. And I'm going to give you a take, the 90 second model. I'll get a professional to reduce it to 60 seconds or 30 seconds. But something that I'd like to put on, and frankly, we've got some cameras here capturing this. And if it looks good, it might be a wrap. We might uh, show this. Uh, around the country or we'll try to give it to those organizations like the National Taxpayer Limitation Committee and things like that. Okay, are you ready for take one? You know, some people need that American Express gold card and its $10,000 limit to feel powerful. Others need that platinum card with its $100,000 limit to feel really powerful. I've got a card that puts those two to shame. My congressional voting card, my friends, Take a good hard look at this card. This is the most expensive credit card in the world. This card has no limit. Now, when you or your spouse gets a call from American Express, diners, master charge, whatever, and you've reached your $2,000 limit or your $5,000 limit, you know that economic reality has arrived. You sit down at the table, you discuss your standard of living, you might even defer a vacation. Not with this card. Last year we reached, you know, 2.5 trillion, the national debt. What do we do? We just kept raising the limit. We call it the debt ceiling. We say, pass it on to the kids. Let them pay for it. We've got a credit card mentality in this country. And you know something? We've got to remove this card from those legislators, Democrat or Republican, that are using it irresponsibly. Jody Aguadi, CPA, former congressman. Does that make sense to you? Okay. That's the message I think that we've got to get out to the people. Now, this one worked so well, it became my logo. I got on the cover of two magazines, not Time and Life, but Management Accounting and uh, the Department of Commerce of the Westchester County. I, I got a lot to go yet, but we're making some headway. And it dawned on me that if this thing is making some sense to a lot of people, shouldn't I now follow up with an analysis of the budget in the format of a credit card statement. Take out your little handout, and in it, you'll see what I put together. I conceptualized 
a U.S. taxpayer credit card statement and for anybody from the IRS, I put in a bill and I hope that we're going to put in more bills to have the IRS send out this one piece of paper with the instructions on your tax return in January so we get one page knowing where the money's going. If we're going to pay the taxes, aren't we entitled to some accountability? So basically, what we did in that little statement is we personalized it. I said, hey, here is your share of the national debt at the beginning of the year. And this was an updated model. You know, our fiscal year starts, as you all know, public doesn't know probably, but October 1st. And your share, I just took the number of returns filed, April of 87, about 100 million, divided it into the cash numbers. Mind you, we're not talking about the accrual basis here. I'm talking about that Mickey Mouse system that government still uses, called the cash basis. Divided it in, and we got your share of the national debt, 18,242.12. Now, as any credit card statement, we got to show you what we bought for you with this card you gave me. Here it is. Purchases. Your share of Social Security and Medicare, 2008-77. Your share of National Security, Defense. Welfare, agricultural subsidies, going down. Hey, you want to know how numbers begin to talk at this level? Once you get away from trillions, you begin to understand numbers, okay? Look at the difference on this. I could have given you 30 or 40 items, but I picked some for effect. Look at criminal justice system. $88.94 a taxpayer. Look at agricultural subsidies, $166.28. We got a war on drugs, and we're spending twice for agricultural subsidies than we're spending on the criminal justice system. Now that should tell you something. And it told me that the public doesn't have ready access to a lot of information upon which to make good judgments as voters. And guess what? Worse than that, Congress people and senators don't have access to this kind of information. I didn't find a good database when I was in Congress to make these comparisons and evaluations. And therefore, the political process runs rampant and numbers are controlled by politics, not by common sense. And that's the problem we have. Look at the payment section. Now that's the average taxes paid by individuals. Taxpayers, 3,882.13. And look what I say, thank you for your prompt payment. Okay, that was April, April 15th. Below that, Social Security taxes and contributions, 3,230.29. Now, Mr. Cusero, one of my favorite guys for lunch, I used to go out to lunch with the uh, Inspector Generals. Most people wouldn't, you know, take accountants out to lunch. I couldn't wait. I wanted to find out what was going on in government. So I would call an IG and take him out to lunch. And, you know, after a, a luncheon, they'd start leveling with me about what the real problems were. But Dick Cusero is really a mensch. He knows what he's doing. And anybody in HHS, he's on the forefront of getting good changes made, especially with Dorcas Hardy and the Social Security Administration. But look at this number, Social Security taxes. You know what happened. Carter put the Social Security taxes on automatic pilot. Every year, for about the last 10, the base has gone up and the rate. Isn't that right? Now, you would think this is, this is money that's going into the Social Security Trust Fund. Well, you know, that's the biggest joke in the world. There is no Social Security trust fund per se. There's an account, there's a pencil entry, but with that unified budget that Lyndon Bain Johnson's passed, Johnson passed in order not to raise taxes for the war on Vietnam, you know what they did? They just melded all the trust accounts with the big pot and they raped those accounts of all the cash and they put IOUs in the account. And you know what an IOU is? It's a treasury bill. It's a treasury bond. So if you went to those accounts now for your money, no, we got to somehow impose taxes on the next generation to put the cash back in the accounts in order to find the money to give you your social security. Now, obviously it's an obligation, legal and moral, and it will be done, but it's gonna be done on the backs of the next generation because I can tell you that there's been a free ride for government since they have not obviously kept pace with tax revenues. What's been happening? They've held the income taxes down to 3882 They're now funding the deficit by Social Security taxes of almost as much as the personal income tax. You begin to see this when you look at the numbers in basic form. Isn't this intergenerational rape? Isn't this the biggest shell game in the world? If those kids knew what we were doing to them, they would be speaking up right now. I'm not just talking about children. I'm talking about the kids in high school and college. This is not the right way to make America stronger, to be competitive. We have big competition these days with Japan. 
we have to rebuild the capital of America. It's not being done by spending. It's certainly not being done by the savings rate being below 4% when Japan is above 20%. And we've got to re-examine where we are going as a nation. And look at the final item I put, finance charge. What's the finance charge? It's your share of the interest on the national debt. Look at that number. It's now up to $1,465 per taxpayer. And if you look at the increase in the national debt from 18242 to 19734 it's mainly the interest on the national debt. Think about that. What did we borrow last year to pay the interest on the national debt? $155 billion. That's what it'd be. Billion dollars. Now, mind you, none of that money, not one dollar, went for roads, went for social welfare, went for doing anything good for people. And guess where it went? Most of it went to Japan, West Germany. Why? We are now hooked on foreign capital. God forbid Japan and West Germany didn't buy, at the end of the month, our treasury bills, our treasury bonds, to help us make up for the deficit. You know where you see interest rates right now? Back where they were when Carter left, probably 21%. We don't know where we're going right now. You can't find two economists to give you the right story. We're in uncharted waters. We've never had an expansion of seven years with deficits this large. In fact, deficits came about to kind of round off recessions so that you can get on to the next period. Can you imagine? God forbid we had a major economic correction. Where do we go? It's brinksmanship, and it shouldn't be. We should be smarter than that, and the system has to change. Now, let me give you a little example about Japan, because these people are very smart. They're good people, they work hard, and you know, they learned a lot from us. I think it's time that we started looking at them, because we remember what we used to do very well after World War II, that they're doing well right now. They produce, they save, and they plan. Are they concerned about earnings per share? When Baker came out with that plan, and he dropped the value of the dollar just to reduce the trade deficit, which would hurt Japan because they depend on exports to us, did Japan panic? First of all, it wasn't the right thing to do, I don't think. It's taking another aspirin or a band-aid. It's treating the symptom and not the problem just to drop artificially the value of the dollar. But look at Japan. Their response was beautiful. They said, well, what's our major concern? It's not earnings per share. It's market share. So what they did is just drop the profits enough to absorb that and kept their market share because they're thinking five years ahead. They're thinking ahead. What we're doing, we're reacting. We're trying to meet this quarter's profit and loss earnings per share. We're robbing Peter to pay Paul. We're one step ahead of the sheriff, and we're putting out fires. That's what I witnessed in four years on Capitol Hill. And I want you to know, because you are shareholders in America. You are voters. You are citizens. I'm giving you an accounting. And I think I know what I'm talking about. I was trained very well at Arthur Anderson. I got a lot of good experience in Congress. And I see this as the most critical issue. And don't think Japan doesn't see it. Because when we beat up on them ceaselessly, when Toshiba did that unconscionable act, remember the security problem we had? They sold something. I guess it was to Russia. Congresswoman Helen Bentley, a real feisty person, invited all the Congress people to join her on the front lawn of the Capitol and said, bring your Toshiba radios, television sets, right? And she got a sledgehammer and started really wailing away. She wanted to make a point, all right? Well, you remember the point that Japan made very quietly, but very effectively? That month, instead of buying their usual seven to nine billion dollars of treasury bills, because we're addicted to their money, they bought two billion. That month alone, the interest rate went up on a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, or just that month and shortly after, almost 2%. And then they pulled back, and then interest rates settled again. They sent us the message. We are now a hostage to Japan. We are an economic hostage. We are totally dependent on them now funding our deficit by buying our treasury bills. They didn't have to lobby. Because the most politically sensitive thing that anyone can do in this country right now is to play with interest rates. And you know that. Higher interest rates would do havoc. So, what is the solution? The solution to me, there are two solutions. One's political, 
and you're not going to resolve the political solution here, but I believe every congressperson should be pressing for it. I believe that you do need a balanced budget amendment, not one with a straitjacket, you know, one that you can have some exceptions on in times of national security problems or insecurity. Uh, but you do need, I think, a balanced budget amendment. We need to put some kind of a discipline on the system. It's not there. Graham Rudman is kind of like the brakes on you know, fiscal spending, that careening fiscal spending vehicle. But it's not the steering wheel. We've got to come up with that steering wheel now. The other thing we need is a line item veto. 43 governors have it. There's no reason for Congress to be lumping every spending bill into one as they did a couple of years ago when they present to the President and Congress at the 2 o'clock in the morning a $600 billion melded spending bill. You can't pick what's good from what's bad. Take it or leave it. And if you don't take it, America shuts down because there's not enough money to pay for the IRS and, and all the government employees. So it's a game of chicken that's played, and it's wrong to be doing this at the public's expense and the future of America. So we can't talk about those political solutions. Why? It's a longer range thing. It's who you're going to vote for, who projects your values. If you agree that that's an important thing, according to your politics, then you've got to be sure that those people who are in Congress are the ones that are going to reflect your values and vote for those things. Let me tell you what I have to crusade on. I crusade on the other solution, and that's what I call the systemic structural solution. And as accountants, I think you can understand this. We right now, as I said, have the most Mickey Mouse accounting system in the world. The cash basis in government is designed for politicians. Why? They can defer uh, expenses, they can accelerate revenues, they can sell assets, bring in the total into the budget. They can do what they want. They can make the bottom line literally fit their own political agenda, which may not be the right agenda for we the people. And that's a problem. I see it. Now, the SEC has mandated on public corporations something called generally accepted accounting principles. Sure, they're implemented and reviewed and promulgated by the accounting profession. The SEC steps aside on that. But they maintain their enforcement. And if you don't do it right, you could literally go to jail as an officer of a corporation if your accounting isn't under those rules. But yet government, the biggest financial enterprise in the world, is not held to the same standard. It's the old double standard. Do as I say, not as I do. Until the taxpayers get onto that, government will continue to do it. So the only way we're going to change it, only one way. It's by the political process. More people getting involved. More people registering. More people voting. More people writing their congressmen. More people writing the editors. Op-ed op -ed pieces. There's not enough of that going on. In fact, sadly, we're going in the opposite direction. I was pained to find out in the year before the presidential year, only half the people qualified to register to vote registered, and only half those voted. So 25% of the people in the United States of America elected our officials. That's a formula for some group coming in someday to get a handle on America. And we got to look at that. And maybe it's because they're not getting the right information. So I headed a task force. I said, well, since I don't see it, what am I going to do? So I got at least my party, the Republican Party, but I got many Democrats to support it, to come up with a task force that I chaired and we named it the Financial Management in Federal Government Task Force, A System in Crisis and Options for Reform. Anyone who wants a copy of this, I will make you a copy. In fact, I'll leave a copy with George. But basically, it was a schematic for what government needs. And you know what it started with? It started with a system close to generally accepted accounting principles. I'm not sure that gap would fit. But you know something? Elmer Statz, the former Controller General is now the head of the Government Accounting Standards Board, and they're looking at accounting principles for states and local governments. When he's finished, why not keep him in place, or that board in place, and do it for the federal government? We need a better system of accounting principles. We need uniform accounting standards, or uniform accounting systems. Would you believe the GAO reported a couple of years ago over 250 accounting systems, over 50 payroll systems in government? Even if you had compatible computers, 
which we know we don't have. Even if you had compatible ledgers, in a sense, when you feed that kind of diversity of information in, you'd never get anything that's meaningful. And I think that's what's happening to us now. So we need uniformity, whether you're on the cash or the accrual basis, but we need both uniformity and something close to the accrual basis. What else do we need? Yes, we need a chief financial officer. You might say, what about the GAO? What about the OMB? What about this? What about that? OMB, for instance. You know what I found out in four years? It's all B, no M. It's totally budget driven. They have a few people running around with management titles, but I don't think that's the place to put it. We need an independent chief financial officer, a person, man or woman, independent of the political process with the prestige, with the kind of continuity and position that the controller general has. Maybe not a 15 year term, but maybe a 10 year term. We need a capital budget. Would you believe we spent last year $200 billion in capital items? 100 billion for the military, 100 billion for other agencies in procurement, and we don't have a capital budget. That's wrong. And finally, I think we need financial management reform. We have to make numbers talk to us. It's not enough to shovel numbers around on a piece of paper. We've got to look at that. And I think you know enough about that already. Okay, let me conclude because you have to have your lunch. We have to continue the crusade. I will leave you with two quotes because I think they best embody what I believe. And by the way, I gave you all the bad news. There's a lot of good news about America. This America brought us all here, okay? But I can tell you this. Lord Acton once said that capitalism is the unequal distribution of wealth. But then he said socialism is the equal distribution of poverty. Think about that. And that's why America is a good place at all times compared to anything else. We got our problems, but this is still the best social experiment the world has ever seen. Finally, to urge you to action, Edmund Burke. What did Edmund Burke said? Say he said, all that is necessary for evil to prevail is that good people do nothing. So let's energize we the people. Let's get out there and do at least the basic amount to make sure we vote, register to vote, get our friends to do it, our neighbors to do it, and write some letters. And thank you for your attention. I'm pleased to be here.